I'm setting an example for my kids. I got be a side hustle. I have more control of my destiny. I need multiple streams of income. It's hard work, but I'm working for me. A job is cool, but I need more. It's all about being self-employed. You're tuned into the world of self-employed and rising with Art Taylor, where we bring you the amazing stories of people who are challenging the odds and following their dreams of self-employment. Learn from their successes and be inspired. Hear creative ideas for your business and find tips to take your hustle to another level. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Self-Employed and Rising, a new weekly edition. And today we are going to talk about how to be beautiful. And to talk about that with me is my dear cousin, Mecca Jones. And you're going to have a great time listening to Mecca's stories because she's one of these people who kind of started early in life with a sense of what she wanted to be when she grew up. And she followed that passion into a now very successful career in the hairstyling industry. And so, Mecca, yeah. welcome to Self-Employed and Rising. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. So, Mecca, let's get into that story a little right, bit. Let's get into I mean, I know it started really early in life, but when did you first recognize that there was something in your future related to hairstyling. Well, the acknowledgement came a lot later on. Um, although the passion was there as a very young girl, I was around the age of 10, even a little before that, when I realized that I love styling my baby dolls and I could style my own hair. My mother no longer needed to do it for me. And so at that point, I was like, oh, okay, this is just something I can do. Not realizing that there's the majority of the world that can't do that at the age of 10. So it was just something that I was like, oh, okay, oh, well, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> and once my mother came into my gifting and she started to acknowledge it, she was like, well, can you do my hair? I'm like, oh, well, sure. And then it was my sister and then it was the neighborhood. So then I became the neighborhood hairstylist by the age of 13. Wow. And How about that? You know, that's uh, really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and it's no, it's really interesting because I, I listened to one of my favorite Martin Luther King speeches is the one where he talks about whatever you do in life, essentially do it with passion. Yeah. You know, if you're going to be a painter or if you're going to be a, even a person who sweeps the streets, yeah. do it like Michelangelo was painting the Sistine Chapel. Mm. You know, have a passion for what you do and do it with excellence. That's good. And I think for a lot of people that excellence comes with passion. Yep. You know, it seems to emanate not only from the knowledge that they're going to get something done, but also the doing of it there seems to be this enjoyment from actually doing it, not simply what the outcome is. What is your thought about that? Do you just enjoy being in someone's hair, knowing that at the end it's gonna make them beautiful? Or are you just appreciative of both the end result and the process of doing it? A little both. I believe that it works hand in hand. Um, I actually get enjoyment out of both size and the whole process is what I call it. It's a process. And I get a different type of fulfillment out of each part of that process. So, you know, the seeing what it is and knowing that it's going to be something completely different when I'm done and then actually seeing the change and the development and the evolution happen throughout that process for me, it's just like an adrenaline rush. So, you know. Well, I can understand that. That is, uh, you know, really key. That's really key yeah. to, to being successful, I think. Absolutely. So, yeah. So tell me, tell me about 
what you actually do and how you sort of transition from one thing to really finding coloring as your thing, so to speak. Okay, so I am a salon co-owner right now. Uh, well, first and foremost, I'm a child of God. And um, I'm a salon co-owner. I am an artist. I am an educator. And I'm an operator in my salon. So I do wear a lot of hats. Um, so, you know, I just, I, when I started out as a little girl, I mainly dealt in the area of styling and braiding, um, the sim more simple stuff, which is really complicated when you really look at it. But then once I went into hair school, cosmetology school, I was able to see the different facets of the hair industry. And I really gravitated towards the color portion of it and the cutting portion of it. So that in itself, you know, kind of made give, gave me goosebumps. And once I got into the salon, that's just what I gravitated towards. And those were the clients that I attracted. And it just kind of pivoted from there. So you, tr you attracted clients who appreciated what you were doing with the coloring and the cutting. Mm -hmm. And that sort of reinforced you heading in that direction is what you're correct. And one of the ways that I did that is I was my own advertisement. So I would get the cuts and the colors that I really like and people would stop me all over the place and say, Oh, I love your color, or I love your cut. And who did it? And I'm like, I did. <laughs> and so I would gain a lot of clients that way and then word of mouth. I never advertised. One, one. Well, it's clear that, you know, you are a walking billboard for your services, right? I never advertised one bit of my career, of my craft. Um, it, word of mouth is a real thing. Um, you know, if someone loves what you do, they will tell everyone about what you do. And they will have everyone attracted to you. So I got a lot of clients just that way. And so much so that I had to close my book off at a certain point and say that I can't accept any more clients because I'm only one person. So it's wow. a blessing. It definitely is a blessing. So how long did it take you to go from I'm just starting out to really get to a place where you were feeling financially viable in your in your work? Three years. Three years. You know, that's interesting because what I hear is that most businesses don't make it three years. But if you can get past that third year, it seems that you have a good chance of surviving. So that's really interesting that you mentioned three years as the number. And, you know, as we get into this interview, I'm going to want to talk to you about that first three years, mm. because obviously there's a lot for people to learn who are at that process who are in that stage of development. Sure. And I know they're probably going through a lot of difficult moments, a lot of inconsistent feedback. You're not quite sure if you're going to make it or not. Something good happens, then two things bad happen. And you got to figure out how to get beyond that. And I just think that's a key component of success in business. Yeah. And I'm definitely going to want to talk to you about that. Yeah. But I want to also know, Mecca, when you set out to do this, what was in your way? I mean, so what what did you have to overcome just to get going? I would say rejection. I had to overcome rejection. And I think that applies to so many areas of life. Um, just overcome a rejection, just. Just because it's a no now doesn't mean that it's going to be a no later or that the next person is going to say no. You keep trying until you make it kind of thing. So resilience and perseverance is a huge thing for me. Um, I really had to stick it out because you don't just arrive in my industry or any industry for that matter. 
you have to work your way up the ladder. Everybody starts from the bottom. And that's the truth of the matter. And unfortunately, we live in a generation and a time um, in a society that it's the microwave generation and everyone wants everything right now. And if it's not coming right now, then we're going to move on to the next thing and then the next thing. And nobody's sticking it out. No one's following the road. And, you yeah. know, that's something that I really held on to. And I wouldn't let that rejection defeat me. And I, I said, Well, hold on to that thought because we're going to take a short break. Okay. And when we come back, I want to get into what happened that first three years, because I think, again, there's a lot for everybody to learn Absolutely. about the first three years and why a lot of businesses don't make it. We'll be right back after this break. Well, welcome back, everyone. Self-employed and rising. I'm Art Taylor. And with me is Mecca Jones. And we've been having a little conversation about how her business got started, where her passion came from. And we got to talking about the fact that her business became successful after the third year. And we know that there's data out there that points to many businesses not making it to three years, which is the magic number, it seems, when the chances for businesses to succeed goes up dramatically. But there's a lot that goes on that first three years. And Mecca, I really would like you to tell us some of the things you were going through that first three years. What were some of the things that you remember most about that time, even though it's been some time now that you could share with our guests? It's funny that you say what I can remember because I'm like, oh my gosh, that was such a long time ago. However, the first three years, um, what I do remember is making a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes. And typically to be successful, you have to fall a lot of times. And so I'm grateful because what I also remember in addition to the mistakes is my clients being extremely forgiving and, gr and gracious um, to my mistakes. I was thrown right behind the chair, right out of hair school. So <laughs> when I say that I was a newbie behind the chair and the salon owner that I was working for, she had so much faith in me. She believed in me. She saw the potential in me. I was like, oh my gosh, you see more in me than I see in myself, honey. So <laughs> it was that part for me. And that inspired me. I'm like, okay, I can't let her down. But inevitably, when you are a newbie in any industry, you're going to make mistakes. That's a part of the process to make the mistakes. But it's important to not let the mistakes defeat you. You have to overcome those things. And what I did was learn from those mistakes. Okay, I did this wrong. She gave me a chance. Let me do it right next time. You acknowledge what you did wrong and then you try to fix it from there and you get better and better each time. I mean, that's all you can really do. But inevitably, again, you're going to make mistakes. Yeah, we can't do anything as humans without making mistakes, it seems. I always think about a child learning to walk. You know, look how many times a child falls before they can actually walk. And if they don't take the risk and fall down, they're never going to be able to walk. Absolutely. Right? So you, you have to do it or else you will never be able to walk. You'll be crawling around all your exactly. life. Exactly. Exactly. And so it's very similar to almost everything else. Human beings are a trial and error species. You know, everything we do with a trial, we make mistakes, we improve on it, and we go to the next phase. So it's really interesting and important to hear you say that. Because not a lot, we don't like to admit mistake. Nope. No, we don't like to admit that we did things nope. wrong. Nobody likes to admit that. But if you're oh, successful, that's not cute. We yeah. Oh. yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're successful, you've made mistakes. If you're not successful, it's because you haven't really made any we'll mistakes. Make those mistakes and learn from those yeah. mistakes. Yeah. Now, did you have an approach to learning from your mistakes? I mean, 
obviously there had to be days when you came home and you said, mm, I really did something to her hair today. Um, I feel really bad about that. How do you, how did you get past that? I had a mentor. I had a mentor and I think that it's always wise to seek wise counsel when you are looking into a new venture, um, exploring uncharted territory, something that that's unknown. It's always important to seek out the counsel of someone who's been there and done that. Um, and that's what I had. God graced me with that person and I'm forever grateful for her taking my hand and taking me under her wing and saying, Mecca, I got you. I got you. You're going to make mistakes, but don't give up. That's not the end. Your mistakes only come to make you stronger. Okay, you learn from those things. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. I, I don't advise anyone to go into uncharted territory without wise counsel. Yeah, well, that's important, as you say. I mean, I think about all of the young people and not so young people who are trying to learn things. And there's a balance, a balance you want to strike between asking for too much help where you're not really learning. You got other people doing the Enabling. work for you. Enabler. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and then you and then the, the person who wants to try to do everything themselves and is not really going to progress because they're not connected to people who actually know how to do things. So there is that balance that you have to figure out how to strike. But um, I don't know about you, Mecca, but my mother told me many years ago when I was a little boy, if you don't know, ask. That's it. <laughs> and, you know, I followed that. It's, it's humbling sometimes, though. You know, you really want to feel like you got it together. And, you know, you ask some people and it makes you feel a bit vulnerable, right? You feel that you're asking somebody something that you ought to know. Mm. So you feel vulnerable. You feel like you're now subject to criticism. Mm. But the truth is, if you don't know something and you don't ask, how are you going to learn? You have to humble yourself. And that's what you did. You know, you said, I'm going to be around someone who knows what they're talking about. And I'm going to learn everything I can from them as I go through this process. And look what happened. You got through it. What else do you remember this, about that this time? Just to piggyback off what you're saying, had I not had yeah. a mentor, I would have quit. I would have quit the industry. I would have went into administration because I'm good at that, too. Um, or nursing, because it, it seems that all hairdressers who don't make it in the industry goes into nursing. So... <laughs> I wouldn't be in the industry anymore. And that's just my reality. You know, maybe there's some people that, you know, go through the ropes and they just figure it out. I'm not sure how that works, but I wouldn't have stick, stuck with it. I'm sorry, ask your question again. No, no, you were good. I was just asking if there was anything else that you recall from that time since we're in this segment to really find out about that three year period. Was there anything else about that time period that you needed to do that you discovered that kind of got you through that period remain teachable remain teachable because just because i went through the period of cosmetology school i went through all the modules i graduated i took boards I, you know and boards are very stressful and they're intense they're hard i passed my boards and all of that and i got into the salon a lot of times we get into our area of expertise and we think we know it all. And so we don't want to, you know, listen to anyone or follow any direction from authority. And we, we, we think we've arrived. Oh, I got my certification. I got my license. I'm official. Remain teachable to the day you die. Remain teachable. So that doesn't go for just your first three years. That goes for the rest of your career and the rest of your life. Remain teachable. So you definitely dropping some nuggets now. Lifelong learning is obviously important. Find a mentor, someone who you can 
ask questions to and learn from. And obviously be resilient. Don't let your mistakes eat you up. You know, you are making mistakes because it's part of a process of learning. And that's success in and of itself. If you made a mistake, that's one less now that you got to make before you actually come to a place where you can be successful. So, Mecca, we've we're about to come to another break. And when we come back this time, I want to talk about what you actually do to make your clients love you, to make them loyal to you and to make them never want to leave you and obviously give you your give you their money <laughs> on a right, regular right, basis. Right. <laughs> a very important part. We'll be right back after this break. Hello, everyone. Self-employed and rising. I'm Art Taylor. Welcome back. And we're talking with Mecca Jones, a hair colorist, about her amazing business and career. We've now had a conversation about her early days and we had some conversation about that first three year period where things can go sideways for many businesses and they end up going out of business. Mecca made it past that three years because she was able to find a mentor. She believes in lifelong learning and she's not afraid to ask questions. But more importantly, for Mecca, a mistake is a learning experience and not something to tell you that it's over. And she is a person who's embraced all of that. Well, Becca, what I want to talk about now is how you make your clients fall in love with you. How do you make a client so loyal that they couldn't imagine going to anyone else but you? What is your secret to the loyalty? And how how does that work? I mean, how are you doing? I mean, does it seem that your clients do return again? I know you mentioned that you're not even taking on clients at this point because you're so busy. But is that because of how you treat your clients and how they love you? And I want to know how that works. Well, here's the secret. You make it an experience. It's not just an appointment. It's an experience. So when I first got into business, um, for me, it wasn't business. It wasn't money driven. It was ministry and it was service based. So it was literally changing my mind to humbly serving women who you have no idea what they're going through, what they've been through that day, what they have to leave outside your doors. I named my business Hello Beautiful for a reason. When someone calls into my salon, the greeting is Hello Beautiful. When someone walks through my doors, the greeting is, hello, beautiful. It's a game changer for those women who are mentally and emotionally bound. You have no idea, again, what they've been through. And I know because I've been through some stuff. And because of what I've been through, I made it a point and I made a vow to edify those women and I was intentional about that and I continue to be intentional about making women feel good and being a safe place when they walk through my doors it's now safe you are now disconnected from that cruel cruel world that you just stepped out of that's important to me so taking on a servant's mindset that was it. And so cre in, in creating an experience, it starts at the phone call. It starts at them booking an appointment. It's, it continues when they walk through the door and then making them feel like they are the most beautiful woman on the face of this earth. And so it's like, I, no matter what Mecca's going through, you're my priority. <laughs> So, Mecca, are there people that you won't take on? Are there people who have sort of a 
a spirit that you would say, I can't I can't handle them or or is your role more to to help everyone, regardless of their circumstances or, or regardless of what's in them to to see themselves as beautiful anyway? The short answer um, in one word is discernment. And I'm very spiritually inclined. So that means that even through these last five years of me not taking on new clients, there's been times where God, the Holy Spirit, has made me made an exception and say, you need to take on that client. I know what your website says. I know what the policy says that Mecca does not take on new clients. But you need to take on that person and not even giving me a reason why. Oh, I'll find that out soon enough. And I do every single time. It's the greatest thing ever. And it's either me having to pour into them or them having to pour into me. Whatever the case is, we always benefit from it. So, yeah, discernment. Um, And then there are seasonal clients as well. There's clients where I am uh, commanded and uh, made to take on in a season, and then our season comes to an end. So it really is individually based. Yeah, that's that's um, beautiful to hear you say that it's all about making a person feel special. Because we're in a world that will eat you alive. And wherever we can go and feel special, we seem to want to go there, right? We want that. I want more of that. I want more of someone saying to me, you know, regardless of what's going on in your life, you're beautiful. And when you leave this salon, you're going to be beautiful and when you come back next time, you're going to be beautiful. So can, can I, that is, uh, can I just, and, that's, that's pretty, yeah. Just, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm talking over no, you. I don't want to do that. Go ahead. I interrupt you and say that, you know, we've had so many moments in the salon where we are in full out tears because we love doing each other so much. I have clients who sit back in that bowl and because of my touch, because of the way that I massage their scalp and the way that I make them feel like they are priority and they are the most important person in this ex- experience, tears begin to roll from their eyes. Mm. And I still can't wrap my brain around mm. that, that I'm making that kind of difference. Mm. They tears and it comes to a moment where sh- with shampoo, sudden- mm. <laughs> Mm. Still in their hair. I'm sitting that client up and think, what's wrong? What's going on? Mm. Talk to me. Let it out. Some folk would say you have a church in that salon. (laughs) And it becomes so much more than just a hair appointment. 90% of my clients tell me that it's more than just a hair appointment. And you know, hairstylists, we're already labeled as, we double as therapists. So it's not, you know, we're not just working on your hair. We're working on what's going on internally, too. We're talking things out. Um, but it, it's that part. I just want to make them feel as special as they possibly can. So down to the massage, the way that I'm not just shampooing the head. I'm making you feel relaxed, safe, protected, and like you're in good hands. Yeah, and we don't know what a person's been through when they walk through those doors. We don't know what's happened to them and what they're needing at that moment. But you seem to offer an environment, as you mentioned, where they can feel safe and warm and loved and beautiful. Absolutely. And who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want yeah. that? I want that. Yeah. Yeah. I want that. I don't get it. <laughs> You know, Mecca, this sounds a lot like um, self-care. You know, the world of self-care is growing. The the industry around self-care is growing because as time goes on, especially now through this pandemic, people are realizing just how important taking care of self is. And even though we rely on 
our innate desire to help others. You know, that is something that I think drives us. We also realize that sometimes we have to put our oxygen masks on first in order to be of assistance to others. And it seems to me that when a person takes the time out to go make their hair beautiful, what they're essentially doing is saying, I'm not just doing that. I'm taking some time out for me to be pampered and to be cared for so that when I come back, I'm able to do what I set out to do. I'm able to exist in this world that needs me to extend myself on behalf of others. Well, we're going to take one last break, Mecca. And when we come back, I want to talk about how you deal with self-care. How does Mecca take care of Mecca? Because you have a lot of responsibilities, too. We're going to get into that as well and find out how you take care of you. We'll be right back after this break. Well, welcome back for our final segment of this show, Self-Employed and Rising. I'm Art Taylor, and with me is my guest and cousin, who I love so much, Mecca Jones. <laughs> and in this segment, you're going to find out just why I love her so much. Because Mecca is one of these people who wants to take care of everyone. She wants to take care of everybody's issues. She wants to help people. She wants to be the humble servant. And that's a beautiful characteristic. And by the way, I think all of us benefit when we put ourselves in that servant role. I think there's a beauty to that, but it can also be overwhelming at times. And there are moments when the person giving care needs care themselves. And I know, Mecca, that that's something that you've learned. And I want you to talk with us about how you take care of Mecca. And when did you learn? Were there situations that came up in your life that taught you, I can't just serve others. I need time to put my own oxygen mask on. Okay, thank you, Kazo. Thank you, Art. Um, let me preface this by saying that I do believe that self care, when you are exploring the life of being an entrepreneur or entrepreneurship, um, it needs to start at the business plan. Mm -hmm. And in that business plan, I do believe that you need mm -hmm. to plan out and factor in what I like to call EFO, and that's exit from operating. Because I have been an operator in my salon since I've opened it. There at some point has to be a shift from operating in your salon um, to managing. And that's with any business. Of course, when it's your baby, it's firstborn, that's what you're going to do. You're going to be hands-on. You're going to be married to it. And you're going to be there all the time and give it all of your everything. But at some point, you need to be able to shift into not working for your business, but allowing your business to work for you. And that's kind of where I went wrong. I continued to work for my business. And work for my business. I work for my business. So I would be 15, 16, 17, 18 hours in a day just trying to get the money. Just trying to get the money. And I was doing all the work myself. So I think it's very important to have a plan as to be able to exit the operating role and into the managing your business role. So that's part of it. Now, you also have other roles in your life that you have to integrate into being a successful businesswoman, entrepreneur, etc. Right. So you have a family, I do. a beautiful husband and a whole bunch of children 
that look up to you, that rely on you, that need mommy. How do you manage all of that? How do you give everyone what they need and expect? And also take care of what you need too. How does that work? By the grace of God. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's an important one right there. It, it really truly is because that's the only reason I'm not in someone's crazy house with the, the white padded walls with the little window in the door. <laughs> <I'm bad. laughs> that's the only reason. Um, what I will say is that at some point you need to realize that you cannot just keep going and going and going. You need to take breaks. Um, unfortunately, the type of business that I do, it's inevitable that if you keep going the way that I was going, your body will break down. And when your mm -hmm. body breaks down or your health begins to decline, so does your business. It works hand in hand if that's the way you're doing things. So for me, I think the most important part is duplicating myself. And in duplicating myself, I need to find someone who has the same dedication, loyalty, and passion that I do. And be able to teach them my ways. Because it's the ways that I've been doing things that have attracted so many. So to be able to pour that into someone else and have them mirror that and be able to create that experience for the clients is super important. Um, yeah. I had to learn that later on because I had some health issues. I had a heart episode where, you know, I went down. I went down because I continued to pour my everything into it. And that was back in 2018. And you know, that was my wake up moment. That was my coming to Jesus where I realized that I can't do everything that, you know, Mecca, you have to duplicate yourself and be able to delegate certain obligations and responsibilities. And that was really a, a awakening for me. That was eye opening. And so I began to shift how I thought about business. And, that's and what was that shift? You thought more about how to, as you say, make the business work for you Absolutely. as opposed to you working the biz working for the business. Is that what you're. Absolutely. So and in, in addition to the whole heart episode, it's also my body in itself breaking down. I mean, the position no. that you have to hold and, you know, your arms and your back and your posture and all of those things play a part. And so, you know, I come home aching each day. And you, you can't do that for but so long. So at some point, now you need to figure out what else can I do in this industry? I still love the industry. I still have a passion for the industry. So what else can I do besides being an operator behind the chair? Sometimes you need to leave that to the young folks and be able to manage that. Yeah. I can make a product. I can sell retail. I can offer education to consumers and customers. You know, there's a list that a list of things that can happen for me to still have my business work for me. I don't always have to be yeah. so hands on that when I go down, if and when I go down, that my business goes down as well. And if I'm doing it the right way, I won't go down because I'm taking care of myself. In taking care of myself, a lot of the things that I like to do is walk and run each day. So I do try to now um, carve out some time for me to walk. Walking is very therapeutic. You get your exercise in. It clears your mind. Um, I used to run track back in high school, so I do still like to run. I don't run like I used to, but it's still, you know, a really good thing. And health-wise, is allowing that blood flow and it's getting those calories off, and it's also clearing my mind. And I'm seeing the beauty of God, the nature. So you know, it's. So many benefits to just that. For me, that's self-care. And then, of course, my nails. My nails is my jam. I can already do hair. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so that's today's nail jam. 
But, you know, I, I love my nails. Um, and it's something that's like a signature for me. Everyone knows Mecca for her nails. And they're like, oh, my God, I love your nails. <laughs> Everywhere I go, between the nails and the hair. But that's something that I do take time out for every two weeks. I'm not missing my girl at the salon. Mm-mm, gotta go. So between the walking, running, and the nails, um, I do love massages as well. I do have a membership. Okay. Well, you truly are a creative. And a lot of creatives have this spiritual element to them that they draw from. And I can see that you draw from that as well and how important just connecting with that power is both in your ability to create and in your ability to sustain your health and your activities. Well, Mecca, listen, we're out of time, but I can't tell you how thrilled I am that I've had this chance to talk with you. And I just know that all of our guests who are watching this show or who will see it are just so impressed with you. And I know that you're not taking on any clients, but I, I can guarantee you that there are going to be some people who want to find out who this Mecca Jones is in Philadelphia. So get ready for that. That's okay. I'm here for it. This is a new. Well, listen, thanks for joining everyone. Thanks for watching. And you can find us back here next Thursday at 4 p.m. for another edition of Self-Employed and Rising. I'm setting an example for my kids. I got be a side hustle. I have more control of my destiny. I need multiple streams of income. It's hard work, but I'm working for me. A job is cool, but I need more. It's all about being self-employed. You're tuned into the world of Self-Employed and Rising with Art Taylor where we bring you the amazing stories of people who are challenging the odds and following their dreams of self-employment. Learn from their successes and be inspired. Hear creative ideas for your business and find tips to take your hustle to another level.